if the Christian life can be accomplished by you, why aren't you doing it? So why, why aren't you holy? Why aren't you acting the way you're supposed to? Why, not, why don't I do everything right? Why do I sin? Why do you sin? What is wrong with you people? And what is wrong with me? It is so frustrating. If the Christian life has not become frustrating to you, you aren't even, you haven't even started. If you think you got it all worked out, and you haven't gone through Romans chapter 7, where Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am, and if Paul could say that, how in the world can we say we're okay? If the greatest Christian, we consider the greatest Christian since Jesus, Paul, could say of himself that I am a wretched man, how can we say any better than that? How can we say any better? Now this, is, this message this morning is a follow-up from the 10 marks and last week's message. And this is, in the, in, this is about how do you accomplish those 10 marks of a disciple? How do they get accomplished in your life? Because there will be only two ways to accomplish it. Last week I said to you, there are only two gods in the whole universe. There is the Father over all, and there's you and me. There's us. There's only one or the other who will rule in your life. It'll either be the Lord who rules, or you will rule. That's it. Nothing else. It's all about me or him. It's all about you or him running and ruling our lives. So the question has to come down to, how do we live this life that, that we talked about, these 10 marks? How do I have events happening in my life that are terrible without me crashing? How do I forgive people who are mean to me constantly, day after day after day? How in the world do I give of my resources when I can't pay all the bills? Those are all questions about how to live the Christian life. Now, most people would like to look at their own lives and feel like it's okay inside there. Take a look inside. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Take a look inside of your own heart. Guess what you see? I don't know. What's the Bible say? Look at it. Because some of you think it ought to look good. It doesn't. Now, look up here. That heart you looked at, your heart, the Bible says it's exceedingly wicked. Now, I know what we do. We tend to look at our own life and say, yeah, but I'm not all that bad. Ah, uh, and there comes the problem. I'm not all that bad. Uh, I know some people are worse, right? Do you? You know some people worse than you? Do you? Does that make you good? No. It just makes you not as bad. The reality is that compared to the Holy Father that we love and the one we serve, we are wicked. There is nothing good in us. And until you find that place, you will always struggle to be better. Always. This is not about you reforming and reshaping yourself. This is about you dying to yourself. This is about how do I accomplish what God wants? And the answer is you cannot do it. You can't do it. And if you've been trying, you're probably frustrated. So there are really three kinds of Christians. Well, two. Two kinds of Christians. Those who are trying and those who are dead. That's it. Those who try and those who die. Those who try and those who die. Those who try get frustrated. Those who die are at peace. That's just one or the other. So when I say that whole long list of what, what we're guided towards, what we're, that, that's like... That's what the Bible does when it says, you look at the law and it tells all these things you're supposed to do and be. And what does the law tell us? What does Romans tell us the law is there for? 
as a guide to show us we need Jesus. That's what we tell people without Christ. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right? We know that. Right? You know that verse. Many of you have memorized that verse. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the whole point of the law was to be a school teacher. To teach us. You can't make it. I mean, there's just one lesson. Wouldn't that be good if life was just one lesson? The lesson in the Christian life is you can't make it. You can't do it. And someone would say, what if I only sinned one sin? That's one sin too many. For all have sinned means if you only sin... You know, do you know anybody that's only sinned one time? Well, I don't know anybody in this room. Yeah, today. <laughs> today, maybe. No, you know, there's no one who's just sinned once. You and I sin constantly. But if you'd only sinned once, you are less than what God expects. Perfect. There's only been one who is perfect. Right? Jesus. There's only one who has been perfect. So what happened to you when you got saved? When you gave your life to Christ, what happened? See, here's the problem with, with some people today. They don't really know Jesus. They just went to church. And they got churchified. Yeah, that's right. And religion kills. Let me tell you what religion kills. It kills passion. I was looking at some other notes this last week, and I had... Uh, one of the marks of a committed Christian or authentic Christian is they have a passion for Jesus. What happens to religion and going to church and people who've been in church all their lives and maybe they got something happened to them, maybe they got baptized and they joined the church and whatever. What happens to people often is that they just get this religion but they don't have a passion for Jesus. That is not Christianity. Christianity is a passion for Jesus. And if you lack a passion for him, loving him, serving him, following him, obeying him, learning about him, you are a problem with the basic nature of a Christian. The passion for Jesus. So the church is full of people who have no passion for Jesus. Oh, they love to go to church. They could even give. They can tithe. They can go to programs. They can help the poor. But they have no passion inside for Jesus. Religion steals passion. For Jesus steals it because it replaces it and anything that replaces the passion for Jesus is an idol and it takes God's place now sometimes it's we are our own passion right want to be happy want to get along want to have enough money want to have peace in your home those are all things about me ruling my life. Those are all about me being the king of my life. Those are all things about me being God in my life. Those are not about what a Christian says. A Christian doesn't say, how do I feel? A Christian doesn't say, what about me? A Christian says, what about you, Lord? What do you want, Jesus? Man, I'm more worried. I'm more concerned about what you think. When you love someone, you care more about what they think and do, don't you? <laughs> Some of you out there going, I'm not sure. Listen, when you love someone, they're first to you. They're important to you. You set aside yourself for them. And see, if you don't do that, you don't even love those people. You still love yourself. Jesus said, when they asked him the great commandment, what did he say? Love God and love your neighbor. Love God, love your neighbor. What about yourself? Well, he didn't even talk about that. Love God and love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. What's that mean? It means set myself third. Which is why we used to teach the little word joy. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. Listen, love means I don't come first. And in this world today, what comes first? Me. I come first. It's in our government. It's in our culture today. It's everywhere. You see it everywhere. Because you know what's happening, what happens in commercials? It's all about me. What's going to make me feel better? What's going to make me look better? What's going to make people like me more? It's all about me. That is not that self-love. As a Christian, if you are going to be what God wants you to be, you have to get past this self-love and determine it's about Christ. 
So here's the verse. It's up here. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It's no longer I. It's no longer I. That actually says not I, but Christ. It's hard to see that not I, but it's not I, but Christ. If you want a title for the message today, kids, it's not I, but Christ. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. You say, well, I, but, but I'm very much alive, right? You can pinch yourself. Am I alive? Pull a little hair. Pull the hair right back there. Oh, yeah, I'm alive. Yeah, I'm alive. Because you can feel things. Yes, you're physically alive. So what is he talking about? I have been crucified with Christ. It's not I, but Christ. He's talking about an, a walking by faith. You've often heard you get saved by faith. Uh, Colossians 2.6 says, As ye have therefore been saved, so walk you in him. As you've been saved, so walk in him. As you were saved. So how did you get saved? Well, I joined a church. No. Uh, I tithe. No. Uh, I memorized some verses. No. I said a cute little prayer. No. How do you get saved? You submit your heart to Jesus. You bow your heart to him. You bow your knee to him and you say, I give up. I quit. You're the boss of my life. You're the rule of my life. I surrender to you as my Savior. I give it all up to you, Lord Jesus. That's a Christian. That's how it starts. Now, as you received Christ Jesus, Colossians 2, 6, so walk in him. So how did you receive him? How did you become a Christian? You submitted to him as Savior and Lord. Now, how do you walk in him? you submit to him as Savior and Lord. Now most people, this is their picture. Next one. I took out the picture. No, no, don't go any farther. That's fine. Just leave it all there. There's one picture that said, I almost died. I don't know what happened to it. It's my next point. I almost died. Now, that was a picture of a guy, and the actual story is that he was a pastor and he was in a car accident and he almost died and it changed his life. Most Christians almost die, but not quite. And they spend the rest of their lives hobbling through trying to do better, trying to be okay. Some people have walked their Christian lives choosing the right and wrong things, the right things to do and the wrong things not to do, and they become moral people. They don't become dead people. They have substituted morality for Christianity. They've studied, they substituted rules for Christianity. They have substituted their own actions and their own righteousness for reality of Christianity. Let me tell you what that gets you. It gets you one of two things. It gets you frustrated because you can't be good enough. Or it makes you self-righteous, which gives you pride. Because, see, you want to close your eyes and look inside your heart and you want to see that it's okay. That's the self-righteousness. I'm okay. No, you're not okay. Your heart is exceedingly wicked. And unless Jesus comes and replaces himself in there for you, you'll always be frustrated and self-righteous. I don't want you to become self-righteous. I don't want you to walk around saying, I'm a good Christian. Now, I do want you to be good, but not because you're a good Christian, and good Christians don't do that. Now, I'm a Christian, and I don't lie, so I better not lie right now. Listen, that's self-righteousness. So you'll go one of two ways. You'll either get very proud of how good you are, or you'll get very frustrated. Now, which are you? Some of you are very proud, and some of you are very frustrated. N Neither of those brings any joy. If Jesus said, my burden is light and my yoke is easy, why isn't it? Why is it such a hard thing? 
Why can't we go into the world and we got this touch 1,000 people and, and we're going to find out how long it takes us to, to, to talk to 1,000 people about Jesus or about church or anything. You know, how long does it take us to do that? What we're trying to tell people is we got a better way to live. And the better way is not a bunch of rules. The better way is not a bunch of self-righteousness. I'm better than you. There's not, it's not a bunch of frustration. Some of you are frustrated. You want to talk to him about Jesus because you're frustrated. It's frustrating. And some of you have just given in and given up. You've gotten so frustrated, just given up and saying, I guess I am doomed to this horrible sin in my heart. This is just the way I'm going to be the rest of my life. I'll just settle in and this is it. Why would you ever settle? Don't ever settle for anything more or less than what God has promised you. And he has promised you exceeding great joy. Happiness inside. A peace that passes understa all understanding. A grace that is sufficient for anything. A life that is worth living. Something you could tell your neighbors, hey, I got it. God is good all the time. Wait a minute. God is good all the time. But it only happens if you can get this Galatians 2.20 down. I've been crucified with Christ. It's not me who lives. It's Christ. And the issue is the crucifying of the flesh. Now, in theology, in Christian theology, we, we, have, a, we have a concept we call the centrality of the cross. Centrality means it's at the center. The cross is at the center of everything. So we look at what does it mean that the cross is at the center? What does it mean to crucify flesh? What does it mean that the cross is at the center? To be at the center of everything means that everything emanates from that. Everything comes out from it. It's like the sun. Every, all the light comes out from the sun. You know, if you, could, if you could imagine the sun sitting in a dark universe and being the only star, our sun being the only star, if it was the only star, no matter where you went, you would have light emanating from that one star, and you would see the star. That's how we see stars. Light comes from them to our eyes. And we look out at night, and you see distant, distant stars. Uh, I don't even know how many light years away. So many light years away, and there they are, and we can see them because light comes from from them. Imagine if there was just one sun in the whole universe, everything would be focused on that one light. Everything. Because it's the only thing that gives us light. So it becomes the center of our universe. If you will, our sun is the center of our solar system. Got that, kids? You can draw a picture now of the solar system, and you can draw a picture in the center and put the sun, and then underneath it you can put the cross. There's your picture. The cross is at the center. Everything wraps around the, the cross. Everything's about the cross. The cross, the cross, the cross. Why is the cross the symbol of Christianity? Because it's at the center of everything. You don't get saved without the cross, do you? You can't be good enough. You need the cross. You need someone to die on that cross for you. It's not good enough to just be good. You can't be good enough. You need the cross. You need somebody to pay the penalty for sin. Why did Jesus die? Because you sinned? Because I sinned? Gee, who crucified Jesus, by the way? You think it was the Romans? No, it was you. It was me. He died for our sins. So when you gave your life to Jesus, what you said was, I need the cross. Without the cross, I have nothing. So when you have knelt down and gave your life to Jesus, whether you actually knelt down, maybe that ought to be a picture we always do with people. Let's get down on our knees and let's pray. And you kneel down and you look up at the cross, you say, Oh God, if it weren't for Jesus dying, I would not be forgiven today. If it weren't for Jesus dying, I wouldn't have eternal life. If it weren't for Jesus dying, I'd have nothing today. It's Jesus, the cross at the center of your salvation experience. It is also the center of living your life. If it's not the cross at the center, it's you at the center. Now, how are you doing? I don't know. I have a hard time controlling myself. Do you? Do you? I have a hard time being happy. Have a hard time being disciplined. Have a hard time being excited. Have a hard time just 
going through life enjoying today. How about you? See, when you're at the center, everything's wrong. Everything's wrong. Everything's wrong. Nothing quite works. But when Jesus and the cross is at the center, everything works fine. So you have trouble. We talked about those 10 marks. So you have trouble. And you go through your trouble. Trouble happens, doesn't it? Listen, life is tough. It's hard. It's difficult. It has all kinds of scary things happening. It has all kinds of pains, all kinds of disappointments, all kinds of discouragements. Life is tough. But God has promised to be with us. When he's at the center and the core of your being, has the core changed? Has the core changed? No. Something out here might happen. And it'd be rough. But the core says, I am with you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The core is the cross of Jesus. I see that. And so I don't fall apart. Yes, I weep. Yes, I cry. Yes, I hurt. But God is at the core. He rules my heart. He's there. When life gets tough, he's there. Now the question is, if it's not I but Christ... How do I get to dead to sin and alive to God? And how do I crucify the flesh? Here comes the wrap-up part. Paul said he took no value in the flesh. Now, this is an important issue. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You don't need to turn to it. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, Paul really says, I did all these great things in the flesh, but it means nothing. I have no value in the flesh. So we look at each other and we say, okay, who's prettiest? Who's the most handsome? Who's the strongest? Who's the most capable? Who has the most talents? We all evaluate each other on those issues. And Paul said, they mean nothing. And later he says that in the kingdom, those things mean nothing. What does it matter if you can sing well and others can't? What does it matter if you can talk in front of people and others can't? What does it matter if you have all these abilities and talents? They mean nothing in the kingdom. They have no value in the kingdom because they're all a part of the flesh. Now, I'm not saying you don't do things. I'm not saying don't look pretty. I'm not saying, you know, don't dress yourself up a little bit. It would be nice, you know, that we don't look really bad, you know. I'm telling you, that didn't mean anything. I mean, look around, people. We're just average people, aren't we? Skinny, fat, hairy, hairless, you know. We're just normal, regular people. Nothing special. Bearded, those who can't. Just have no value. The problem is the world values those things all the time. Watch the football game. Watch the commercials. What do they value? fleshly ability, fleshly looks. How do you get past that? How do you get past the world's way of living and say there is a better way to live? You have to die to that stuff. You have to want Jesus to rule more than you rule. You have to actually say, I want Christ to rule my life, not me. You have to give up the right to your life. Or you'll always be frustrated or self-righteous. Give it up. Give it up. Isn't worth keeping. If you want to feed your pride, then you'll stay alive. But if you want to be dead to sin and alive to God, you're going to have to crucify the flesh. You're going to have to say, not I, but Christ. It doesn't matter what I want. It doesn't matter what I feel. It doesn't matter about my ambitions. It doesn't matter about my future. Nothing matters but Christ. So I give up my life for him. That's it. You fall on your knees and you say, I quit. I give up. I surrender all. I will give my life completely to him. My, this life means nothing. In fact, I'm an enemy of God. Do you know that your self-life, you become an enemy of God? Now think about this. If you live your life according to what you want, and God wants you to live your life according to what he wants, you are at odds with the Father. We call that enemy. You're fighting him. You ever had it where you, um, 
you know, you tell your kids to do something and they don't do it. Does that ever happen in your house? <laughs> Ever happen in your house? They just don't do it. You're at odds, right? I get home sometimes when our kids were little, and I'd say, I gave them one thing to do. Did they do it? No. What's the deal with that? Your kids like that? It's like one thing I forgot. Somehow kids think that I forgot means I'm no longer responsible, right? I forgot. They somehow think that that gets them off the hook. Do you let your kids off the hook when they say I forgot? No, you better not, because they'll always forget. Because they get conditioned to, oh, there's no problem with forgetting. See, here's the problem. When your kids, you ask them to do something and they don't do it, you have a problem. And as a parent, you have to solve the problem, right? And the way to solve the problem for some parents is let the kid do whatever he wants because I don't want to fight. That's called being lazy and irresponsible. As a parent, you want to say, I can't let that go because you'll learn to be disobedient not only to me, to your, to your father, to your mother, to anyone else, but to God. I, my responsibility is to teach you to be obedient. So guess what's going to happen? And you do some kind of discipline. But you discipline them because you're at odds. Do you think that when you run your life and God wants to run it, that somehow he's in heaven saying it's okay? You are at odds with the father. Daddy isn't happy because it's not best for you and it puts him as second. And he is a jealous God. does not want to be second. So what you have to do is say, uh-oh, I'm running my life instead of him. And you say, I quit. I give up. I surrender. I commit it all. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. Everything. My husband, my wife, my kids, my wealth, my job, my future, my plans, my desires, my hopes, everything given to him. And when you put it on the altar at the bottom of the cross and you lay it down there, you then stand up and say, whatever you want, Lord. That's the Christian life. That's what it means to be crucified to the flesh. And without this, frustrated or self-righteous, one or the other. So God, I surrender all. I surrender everything. It is the only way to live the Christian life. Let me tell you, if you're frustrated, then you put on a smile when you're around others. If you're self-righteous, you judge others. And you feel judged. I've been over here a lot in my life. Feeling judged. And judging. Not a happy way to live. Much happier to die to all of that and just love everybody just the way they are. Now, does God have expectations for you? Absolutely. Christ in you, the hope of glory. As you, walk, as you receive Christ Jesus, so walk in him. Die to that old nature. Let him live. And guess who gets the glory? When things turn out in your life, you can say, well, it's all because of God. Because you know what? My heart's exceedingly wicked. And if it were left up to me, I'd do a worse thing. But naturally now, since Jesus rules and he runs my life, I have surrendered to him. I've crucified the flesh. You know what? He gets all the glory. Who gets the glory in your life? Self-righteousness brings you the glory. Frustration is you looking for glory. But when you walk in the Spirit, as He is in the Spirit, He gets the glory for your life. So it's not about you. It's not I. It's Christ. Now I want you to bow your heads. This is going to be a difficult invitation. This is not going to be easy for anyone to, this morning. And I know that. Dying to self, being crucified with Christ, is an issue that is serious, so the devil fights it. He's always fighting it. He always is going to say, I want control. I want you to be in charge of your life. So it's hard. You're going to say, I don't know if it'll work. Remember when you got saved? 
You remember when you gave your life to Christ, you came forward, you prayed with somebody? You had to exercise faith. That verse says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave his life for me. You live by faith. You crucify, you don't go crucify yourself. You take yourself and you give it to Jesus. He takes care of it. You have to do that by faith. You say, I don't know if it's going to work. Really. When you got saved, you weren't sure it was going to work then. It was faith. Faith. We walk by faith. We trust God. Lord Jesus, if I surrender all to you this morning, if I give it all to you this morning, I trust you to change my life. I will trust you to bring an exceeding joy into my heart. I will trust you. I will trust you. No matter what happens the next moments after, no matter how I feel the next day, I will trust you with my heart. You rule. You reign in my heart. Now that's the charge this morning. Do you want to give up self-righteousness, frustration, and find peace? And only is found by dying. Not I, but Christ. Now here's the hard part. That's a choice only you can make. No one can make it for you. No one can do that for you. Only you can do that. Are you putting on an act? Here's the problem. Another problem this morning. Pride will keep you from this. You either, have to, you either want Jesus more than anything else, or you're stuck in your frustration and stuck in your self-righteousness. It's about dying, and dying sometimes takes saying no to pride. In fact, the breaking of pride is part of the issue. Now, so I'm going to leave an open invitation here. Mary Jo's going to play. And I'm going to invite you to come and kneel at one of the front pew, one of the front seats there, and say, all right, self-righteousness, pride, frustration, I'm tired of it. This is your opportunity. There are some already come. There's some over on, the, on my right here, too. Say, I'm tired of this. Not I, but Christ. I give it all up to him.